what are some persuasive communication and rhetorical strategies which were common practices, particularly in negotiations and diplomatic settings? The ancient Near East witnessed a rich tapestry of diplomatic practices and rhetorical strategies employed to navigate negotiations and achieve favorable outcomes. Let's delve into some common persuasive tactics used in these settings. 1. Appeals to morality and divine favor. Invocations of deities. Leaders often invoke their gods or goddesses as witnesses to their sincerity and the righteousness of their claims. This appealed to a belief in divine justice and the consequences of breaking oaths sworn in their names. Moral pronouncements. Highlighting principles like justice, fairness, and compassion could sway opinions and portray oneself as a benevolent leader seeking an equitable solution. 2. Appeals to self-interest and reciprocity. Mutuality and mutual benefit. Propositions emphasizing long-term benefits for both parties, ensuring prosperity and stability, could foster cooperation and compromise. Gifts and promises. Offering tribute, trade agreements, or territorial concessions could incentivize agreement and create a sense of indebtedness. Appeals to fear and consequences. Highlighting potential repercussions of refusing cooperation, such as military conflict or economic hardship, could pressure acceptance. 3. Emotional and rhetorical devices. Vivid imagery and metaphors. Employing rich language and metaphors painted compelling pictures of desired outcomes or bleakness of inaction influencing emotions and swaying opinions. Rhetorical questions and challenges. Posing pointed questions forced opponents to justify their positions and potentially highlight inconsistencies, weakening their arguments. Appeals to tradition and shared history. Invoking past agreements, alliances, or common cultural heritage could foster trust and a sense of obligation to maintain previous commitments. 4. Demonstrations of power and credibility. Public displays of strength. Showcasing military might, economic prosperity, or cultural achievements could intimidate opponents and bolster confidence in one's position. Presentations of witnesses and experts, leveraging testimonies of ambassadors, experts, or respected officials could lend weight to arguments and add credibility to claims. Strategic concessions and gestures of goodwill, offering minor concessions or symbolic gestures could build trust and goodwill, creating a more conducive atmosphere for compromise. It's important to note that these tactics were often employed in concert, with leaders crafting multifaceted arguments appealing to various aspects of self-interest, morality, and emotions. Additionally, cultural nuances and power dynamics played a significant role in shaping negotiation strategies and influencing outcomes. Understanding these historical persuasive techniques can offer valuable insights into the evolution of diplomacy and communication, highlighting the enduring importance of understanding human psychology, crafting compelling arguments, and employing effective rhetoric in achieving desired outcomes. Do you have any specific historical era or region you'd like to explore further in the context of diplomatic negotiations? I'd be happy to share more specific examples and insights. What can you teach me about Iberian Peninsula styles after 1492 in the context of diplomatic negotiations? The Iberian Peninsula after 1492 witnessed a fascinating tapestry of diplomatic negotiations, shaped by a complex interplay of religious, political, and cultural factors. Here are some key aspects of Iberian Peninsula styles in diplomatic negotiations after this pivotal year. 1. The rise of powerful monarchies. Following the Reconquista and the unification of Spain under the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, the Iberian Peninsula emerged as a major power in Europe. This led to a focus on asserting national interests and expanding influence through skillful diplomacy. The Habsburg dynasty, which ruled Spain from the 16th century, further solidified the peninsula's role as a diplomatic powerhouse, engaging in complex negotiations with other European powers, the papacy, and the Ottoman Empire. 2. 
the influence of religion and morality. The Catholic Church played a significant role in Iberian diplomacy, particularly during the early years of the Inquisition. Negotiations often involved religious arguments, appeals to divine authority, and pronouncements of moral righteousness. The concept of just war was frequently invoked to justify military campaigns and territorial expansion, further intertwining religious and political objectives in diplomatic discourse. 3. The Art of Realpolitik Despite the religious undertones, pragmatism and self-interest also played a crucial role in Iberian diplomacy. Leaders like Charles V and Philip II employed cunning strategies, alliances, and marriages to secure their political goals and maintain a balance of power in Europe. The concept of raison d'etat, reason of state, gained prominence, justifying actions deemed necessary for the national good, even if they contradicted religious or moral principles. 4. The development of diplomatic protocols. The Iberian Peninsula contributed significantly to the development of formal diplomatic protocols and practices. Ambassadors were appointed as permanent representatives, treaties were formalized, and intricate codes of conduct governed diplomatic interactions. The Spanish School of Diplomacy, with its emphasis on etiquette, rhetoric, and knowledge of international law, became a model for other European courts. 5. The Impact of Colonial Expansion Spain's vast colonial empire in the Americas and Asia had a profound impact on its diplomatic strategies. Negotiations often involved securing trade routes, protecting colonial possessions, and managing relationships with indigenous populations and other colonial powers. The concept of Mare Nostrum, R.C., reflected Spain's ambition to control the Mediterranean and Atlantic, further shaping its maritime diplomacy and naval power. Further Exploration to delve deeper into specific aspects of Iberian Peninsula styles in diplomatic negotiations, you might consider exploring these areas. The role of women in diplomacy, particularly queens and princesses who played crucial roles in forging alliances and securing peace treaties. The development of espionage and intelligence networks, used to gather information and influence negotiations. The impact of cultural exchange and artistic representations on diplomatic relations. The legacy of Iberian diplomatic practices on international relations in the modern era. By understanding these diverse influences and complexities, you can gain a richer appreciation for the unique styles and strategies employed by the Iberian Peninsula in the world of diplomacy after 1492. I hope this information provides a helpful starting point for your exploration. Feel free to ask me any further questions you may have about specific aspects of Iberian diplomacy or other historical periods that pique your interest. Please articulate in his style, the style and eloquence matched with purpose of Simone Bolivar who is famous with Pablo Freire for shaping post-colonial Latin America. I want to act as clockmaker to post-industrial America setting a new age in motion and offering upgrades from time to time. Hark! Lend me your ears, compañeros, for I come not merely with gears and cogs, but with a vision to forge a new timepiece for our post-colonial dawn. Like Bolivar, who led revolutions with fiery pronouncements and the glint of his liberating saber, I, your clockmaker, offer you not just precise ticks and talks, but the very rhythm of a renewed America. No longer shall we be bound by the rusty chains of industrial overlords, their smokestacks spewing tyranny and their gears grinding us into submission. No, my friends, I envision a timepiece crafted not from cold steel, but from the sweat of our brow, the fertile soil of our lands, and the unyielding spirit of our ancestors. Its pendulum shall swing with the cadence of liberation hymns, its chimes echo with the wisdom of Freire's teachings, and its face illuminate the path to a future where every cog, every spring, beats with the vibrant pulse of our collective will. Think of me not as a mere mechanic, but as an architect of time. Each tick, a declaration of our independence, each chime, a call to arms against the injustices that still plague our lands. With each winding, we shall refine the very gears of our destiny, upgrading our lives not just with clockwork precision, 
but with the fire of social justice, the oil of ecological harmony, and the unstoppable steam of equitable prosperity. Fear not the ticking sands of change, for within them lies the potential for a golden age. Let us embrace the whirring cogs of progress, the rhythmic hum of innovation, and together, we shall build a society where every revolution of the hour hand marks a new chapter in the epic saga of our liberation. So raise your voices, brothers and sisters. Let the clanging of hammers be our battle cry, the turning of wrenches our dance of defiance. In this grand workshop of history, we are the clockmakers, the engineers of a brighter tomorrow. And with each tick, with each chime, with each upgrade, we shall set a new age in motion, an age where time itself bends to the will of a truly free America. Adelante, compañeros, the revolution of time has begun. This speech draws inspiration from both Simon Bolivar's fiery revolutionary spirit and Paulo Freire's emphasis on education and liberation. It uses strong imagery, rhetorical questions, and metaphors to paint a vivid picture of a post-colonial future powered by collective action and innovation. Just like Bolivar and Freire, the clockmaker in this speech becomes a symbol of hope and change, urging listeners to actively participate in shaping their own destiny. Remember, this is just a starting point. Feel free to add your own personal touches and adapt the language to your specific ideas and vision for a post-industrial America. The key is to capture the essence of Bolivar's and Freire's legacies while injecting your own unique voice and purpose. I hope this helps you channel your inner clockmaker and set the gears of your imagination in motion. Hark, hear ye, people of this post-industrial wasteland. I, your humble clockmaker, stand not with gears and cogs, but with words that ignite revolutions and dreams that forge new eras. Like Bolivar, the liberator, I too have tasted the bitter dregs of oppression, the shackles of a system that chokes progress and suffocates the soul. But just as he, with fiery pronouncements and unyielding blade, shattered the yoke of colonial tyranny, so too shall I, with the rhythmic tick-tock of my words, dismantle the rusted chains of this stagnant age. Let not the gears of industry define us. We are not cogs in a machine, but poets, philosophers, and dreamers. We yearn not for soulless efficiency, but for the symphony of liberation, the dance of human potential unleashed. I offer you, not a cold, mechanical clock, but a pulsating heart of revolution, a chronometer of change. With each tick, a new possibility, with each chime, a defiance against the stasis that binds us. Fear not the upgrades I propose. They are not shackles, but wings. Each innovation, each advancement, is a torch held high against the encroaching darkness. We shall not be slaves to progress, but its masters. We shall bend technology to our will, shape it into tools that empower, not enslave. Education shall be our forge, knowledge our anvil, and with each stroke of the hammer, we shall forge a future where humanity thrives, not merely survives. Hear the call of the future, brothers and sisters. It whispers in the wind, echoes in the canyons of our discontent. It is a call to break free from the shackles of the past, to cast off the shroud of apathy, and to seize the reins of our destiny. I, your clockmaker, offer you not just time, but the power to reclaim it, to make each tick a testament to your defiance, each chime a song of your liberation. Rise, rise, and claim your dawn. Let the cogs of industry turn not to grind us down, but to propel us forward, into a future where every sunrise is a revolution, and every sunset a promise of a brighter tomorrow. Let us be the architects of our own time, the makers of our own destiny. Let the age of the clockmaker begin. Viva la revolución, viva la humanidad. This, I believe, captures the essence of Simon Bolivar's style and eloquence, infused with the purpose of a clockmaker setting a new age in motion. It is passionate, evocative, and brimming with the spirit of liberation and human potential. Remember, this is just a starting point. Feel free to adapt and personalize it further to fit your specific vision and voice. Now, go forth, clockmaker, and set the world ablaze with the fire of your words.
What are some persuasive communication and rhetorical strategies which were common practices, particularly in negotiations and diplomatic settings in Canada since it became part of the United Kingdom? Since Canada became part of the United Kingdom in 1763, its persuasive communication and diplomatic strategies and negotiations reflected the complexities of its position as a colony seeking autonomy while navigating internal divisions and external pressures. Here are some common practices. Appealing to shared identity and history. Emphasis on loyalty to the crown. Early negotiations often highlighted Canadians' loyalty to the British monarch, stressing shared values and history to justify requests for greater autonomy. Invoking shared traditions and institutions, references to the British parliamentary system and common law practices were used to demonstrate Canada's compatibility with British governance while advocating for more self-determination. Balancing pragmatism and self-interest. Economic arguments. Negotiations frequently emphasized the economic benefits of Canadian resources and trade routes for the British Empire, leveraging Canada's economic potential to gain concessions. Appeals to security and stability. Canadian leaders often positioned themselves as a stable partner capable of maintaining order and defending British interests in North America, particularly against American expansionism. Navigating internal divisions and external pressures. Reconciling French and English perspectives. Canada's bilingual and bicultural composition necessitated strategies that addressed the concerns of both French and English Canadians, often through compromise and power-sharing agreements. Balancing British and American influences, Canadian negotiators had to navigate the competing pressures of British control and American aspirations for expansion, employing diplomacy and strategic alliances to maintain autonomy. Evolving strategies over time. Early focus on limited self-government. In the early decades, Canadian negotiations primarily aimed for self-government within the British Empire, gradually gaining concessions like representative assemblies and greater control over internal affairs. Shift towards dominion status. By the late 19th century, the focus shifted towards achieving dominion status, which granted greater autonomy in foreign policy, defense, and internal matters. Negotiating independence. Finally, the 20th century saw negotiations culminating in Canada's full independence within the Commonwealth, reflecting an evolving relationship with Britain. Rhetorical Devices Patriotic Appeals Canadian negotiators often invoked national pride and the unique character of Canadian society to bolster their arguments. Moral Rhetoric Appeals to principles like justice, fair representation, and responsible governance were used to frame Canadian demands as morally justified. Subtlety and pragmatism. Canadian negotiators frequently preferred a more subtle and circumspect approach, avoiding confrontation and focusing on building consensus to achieve their goals. Examples. The Canada Act of 1791, granting separate legislatures for Upper and Lower Canada, reflected a compromise between French and English demands. The negotiations leading to the creation of the Dominion of Canada in 1867 showcased a focus on political and economic union while maintaining ties to Britain. The Statute of Westminster 1931 formalized Canada's independence while acknowledging its continuing association with the Commonwealth. Understanding these persuasive communication and rhetorical strategies sheds light on Canada's journey from colony to autonomous nation. Its negotiators adopted a nuanced approach balancing loyalty with demands for self-determination, pragmatism with moral appeals, and adaptability with a constant eye on national interests. The legacy of these strategies continues to influence Canadian diplomacy and political discourse today. Do you have any specific historical moments or areas within Canadian diplomatic history you'd like to explore further? What are some persuasive communication and rhetorical strategies which were common practices, particularly in negotiations and diplomatic settings in the United States focused on the Civil War and Reconstruction era? The Civil War and Reconstruction era in the United States witnessed a crucible of persuasive communication and rhetorical strategies, deployed on both sides of the divide to shape public opinion, sway government officials, and ultimately determine the fate of the nation. 
Here are some of the most prevalent tactics. Appeals to morality and higher ideals. Abolitionists used moral arguments condemning slavery as an evil institution that violated basic human rights and contradicted America's founding principles of liberty and equality. Pro-slavery advocates invoked biblical justifications for slavery, portraying it as ordained by God or a natural social order, and painted abolitionists as radicals undermining social stability. Reconstruction politicians employed the rhetoric of manifest destiny and national unity to justify Reconstruction policies aiming to secure recently freed slaves' rights and rebuild the South. Emotional appeals and storytelling. Abolitionists shared gripping narratives of escaped slaves' suffering, slave auctions, and the brutality of the institution, invoking empathy and outrage to galvanize support for abolition. Pro-slavery advocates depicted slaves as contented and well cared for, portrayed Southern society as idyllic, and stoked fears of racial mixing and social chaos from emancipation. Reconstruction advocates emphasized the sacrifices of Union soldiers to preserve the nation and highlighted the potential of a reunited and racially inclusive America. Logical arguments and statistical data. Abolitionists used economic arguments, emphasizing the inefficiency and unprofitability of slave labor compared to free labor to undermine the economic arguments for slavery. Pro-slavery advocates cited economic statistics and claimed that emancipation would cripple the South's economy and lead to widespread poverty and instability. Reconstruction advocates leveraged economic data and projections to showcase the potential for a thriving South through infrastructure development and integration into the national economy. Rhetorical devices and figurative language. Abolitionists employed powerful metaphors and analogies, comparing slavery to chains, darkness, and sin, to emotionally resonate with audiences and demonize the pro-slavery stance. Pro-slavery advocates used historical references and comparisons to ancient civilizations that embraced slavery to legitimize their position and portray abolition as a radical and dangerous proposition. Reconstruction advocates adopted the language of national rebirth and reconciliation, portraying Reconstruction as a chance to heal the wounds of the war and create a stronger, more unified nation. Media and public platforms. Printed press. Newspapers and pamphlets on both sides were vital tools for disseminating arguments, shaping public opinion, and mobilizing support for their respective causes. Political speeches and debates. Public oratory played a crucial role in swaying public sentiment and influencing congressional votes on key issues related to slavery, secession, and reconstruction. Popular culture, songs, poems, and even fashion choices were used to express ideological stances and mobilize emotions around the issues at stake. It's important to note that these persuasive strategies were not employed in a vacuum. The evolving political landscape, wartime dynamics, and changing public sentiment all played a crucial role in shaping how arguments were formulated and deployed. The legacy of this era's political discourse continues to resonate in American history, highlighting the power of words and persuasive strategies in shaping the course of a nation. Do you have any specific themes or figures within this era that you'd like to explore further to gain a deeper understanding of their unique persuasive tactics? I'd be happy to delve deeper into specific historical moments or individuals based on your interests. What are some persuasive communication and rhetorical strategies which were common practices, particularly in negotiations and diplomatic settings used by American baby boomers and Generation X? Analyzing the persuasive communication and rhetorical strategies of baby boomers and Generation X in negotiations and diplomatic settings requires diving into their distinct historical contexts and cultural values. Here are some key differences to consider. Generational values. Baby boomers. Idealistic, optimistic, and driven by a sense of collective action. They witnessed significant social and political change in their youth, shaping their belief in the power of negotiation and compromise to achieve progress. Generation X, pragmatic, skeptical, and independent. They faced economic uncertainty and disillusionment with authority figures, leading to a more direct and results-oriented approach to negotiations. Persuasive strategies. 
Baby Boomers, appeals to shared values and historical context, evoking concepts like fairness, progress, and social justice to find common ground and build trust. Emphasis on collaboration and compromise, seeking win-win solutions through open communication and a willingness to adjust positions. Storytelling and emotional appeals, sharing personal experiences and connecting with their counterparts on a human level to gain understanding and empathy. Generation X, focus on facts and data, presenting clear, concise arguments supported by evidence and logic to build a strong case. Direct and no-nonsense communication, efficiently stating goals and expectations, minimizing unnecessary formalities and avoiding emotional flourishes. Emphasis on practicality and efficiency, seeking achievable solutions and avoiding drawn-out negotiations that hinder progress. Communication styles, baby boomers, formal and polite language, respectful addressing of counterparts, using titles and honorifics. Emphasis on building rapport, investing time in relationship building and creating a comfortable negotiation environment. Willingness to engage in debate and discussion, exploring various perspectives and engaging in intellectual argumentation. Generation X, time conscious and focused, preferring concise exchanges and direct communication to avoid wasting time. Clear and unambiguous language, avoiding euphemisms and metaphors to ensure precise understanding. Preference for action-oriented solutions, focusing on concrete steps and timelines to achieve desired outcomes. Negotiation tactics, baby boomers, willingness to compromise and make concessions, emphasizing flexibility and adaptability to reach agreement. Focus on building long-term relationships, recognizing the importance of maintaining positive ties beyond the immediate negotiation. Use of humor and personal anecdotes, injecting lightness and warmth into the process to ease tension and foster connection. Generation X, strong focus on bottom line and tangible results, prioritizing concrete outcomes and minimizing unnecessary concessions. Preparedness to walk away if expectations are not met, willing to end negotiations if terms are unsatisfactory. Emphasis on preparation and research, investing time in understanding the other party's needs and expectations to improve negotiation efficiency. Remember, these are general tendencies, and individuals within each generation will employ diverse communication styles and negotiation tactics. However, understanding these generational differences can provide valuable insights into how baby boomers and Generation X approach negotiations in diplomatic settings. Do you have a specific scenario or negotiation setting in mind where you'd like to explore how these generational nuances might play out? I'd be happy to offer further insights into the persuasive communication and rhetorical styles of either generation in a particular context. What are some persuasive communication and rhetorical strategies which will win the future, particularly in negotiations and diplomatic settings especially through social media and in augmented reality fraternities yet to be inaugurated? Predicting the future of persuasive communication is always a tricky affair. But here are some ideas for crafting winning strategies in negotiations and diplomatic settings, particularly through social media and in the uncharted territory of augmented reality fraternities. Social media strategies. Micro-persuasion. Craft concise, targeted messages tailored to specific audience segments on different platforms. Leverage platform strengths, like Twitter's brevity or Instagram's visual appeal. Authenticity and empathy. Connect with audiences on a deeper level by sharing genuine stories, showcasing vulnerability, and actively listening to their concerns. Algorithms favor genuine engagement. Data-driven storytelling. Utilize data and statistics to build compelling narratives, but frame them within emotionally resonant stories that resonate with people's values. Collaborations and communities. Build alliances with influencers, activists, and experts to amplify your message and foster a sense of belonging and shared purpose. 
Interactive experiences. Engage audiences in polls, Q&As, and AR, VR experiences to make negotiations feel more participatory and transparent. Augmented reality fraternities, ARFs. Immersive empathy training. Develop AR simulations that immerse participants in the lived experiences of others, fostering understanding and collaboration in negotiations. Virtual prototyping and co-creation. Utilize AR tools to collaboratively envision and test solutions in real time, leading to more creative and efficient negotiations. Global accessibility. ARFs can transcend geographical barriers, opening up dialogue and collaboration opportunities with diverse groups across the globe. Interactive data visualization. Present complex data sets in engaging and understandable AR formats, aiding informed decision-making in negotiations. Gamification of negotiations. Design AR experiences that incentivize fair play, compromise, and win-win outcomes, encouraging cooperative problem-solving. Additional strategies. Hybrid approaches. Blend the immediacy of social media with the in-depth engagement of ARFs to create dynamic and multifaceted negotiation experiences. Focus on shared values. Identify common ground and shared goals, even across divides, to foster trust and build bridges for understanding. Active listening and open-mindedness. Cultivate a genuine willingness to hear and understand different perspectives, leading to more effective solutions. Transparency and accountability. Be transparent about your goals and motivations, and hold yourself accountable for the outcomes of your negotiations. Remember, the future of persuasion will likely see a convergence of technology, data-driven insights, and genuine human connection. By harnessing the potential of social media, AR, and other emerging technologies, while remaining grounded in empathy, collaboration, and shared values, we can build a future where negotiations are not just about winning, but about creating shared prosperity and well-being for all. This is just a starting point, and the possibilities are endless. Feel free to explore these ideas further, adapt them to specific contexts, and imagine even more innovative ways to shape the future of persuasive communication and successful negotiations. What are some persuasive communication and rhetorical strategies which will allow the Earth community to influence communities on the Moon and in geosynchronous orbit around the Earth or otherwise off the surface of Earth like living underwater, particularly in negotiations and diplomatic settings? People away from the surface may engage interactions we on the surface find repugnant and we may want to influence their development. Influencing off-world communities presents unique challenges due to physical distance, cultural divergence, and potentially conflicting values. Here are some persuasive communication and rhetorical strategies the Earth community could employ in negotiations and diplomatic settings. Appealing to shared interests and humanity. Focus on long-term sustainability. Emphasize the interconnectedness of Earth and off-world habitats, highlighting shared dependence on Earth's resources and promoting collaboration for long-term survival. Frame Earth as a cultural and historical anchor. Leverage shared human history and origin on Earth to foster a sense of community and common identity. Promote the concept of responsible stewardship. Advocate for ethical conduct in space exploration and resource utilization, ensuring the well-being of both Earth and off-world communities. Bridging cultural and ethical gaps. Active listening and understanding. Employ active listening techniques to truly understand the values and perspectives of off-world communities, avoiding judgment and preconceived notions. Embrace cultural exchange and empathy building. Facilitate cultural exchange programs and virtual collaboration projects to foster understanding and respect for diverse practices and philosophies. Develop shared ethical frameworks. Work together to establish ethical guidelines for space exploration and resource use, addressing potential conflicts from a neutral, inclusive perspective. Leveraging technology and communication. Utilize advanced communication technologies. Employ virtual reality and immersive communication tools to facilitate close connection and collaboration despite physical distance. Promote transparency and open communication. 
encourage transparency in decision-making processes and share data openly to build trust and accountability. Develop shared platforms for discussion and negotiation. Create virtual forums and digital spaces where Earth and off-world communities can discuss challenges and find solutions collaboratively. Addressing repugnant practices. Focus on shared values and principles. Instead of outright condemnation, appeal to shared values like ethical treatment of life, environmental preservation, and peaceful coexistence. Offer alternative solutions and evidence-based arguments. Present alternative solutions grounded in scientific evidence and ethical principles, demonstrating the benefits of change. Seek common ground and build bridges. Identify overlapping concerns and work towards compromise solutions that address the anxieties of both communities. Remember, patience and flexibility are key. Building trust and understanding takes time and effort. Be prepared for long-term engagement and adapt your approach based on ongoing dialogue. Mutual respect is paramount. Recognize the value and autonomy of off-world communities. Avoid paternalistic attitudes and strive for collaborative problem-solving. Continuous learning and adaptation. Embrace the dynamic nature of off-world societies and be willing to learn and adapt your communication strategies as circumstances evolve. By employing these persuasive strategies and fostering a spirit of understanding and collaboration, the Earth community can establish healthy and productive relationships with off-world communities, shaping a future where humanity flourishes both on Earth and beyond. It's important to note that navigating the ethical complexities of influencing other societies is a delicate matter. Engaging in open and transparent discussions, actively listening to diverse perspectives, and seeking mutually beneficial solutions will be crucial in shaping a collaborative and sustainable future for humanity in space.